Welcome to Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast for fans who aren't ready to let go and newcomers to this series who are ready to jump in. I'm Drew Shulman. And I'm Marie Vigourou. In this episode, we're diving into Supernatural Season 5, Episode 16, Dark Side of the Moon. Let's get this show on the road. This episode really took me for a spin. Right? I still don't really know where the title connects, like Dark Side of the Moon, unless there's another reference besides the Pink Floyd album that I'm not getting. Definitely is the Pink Floyd album. I think it's also, you know, to kind of talk about this, that mysterious thing that we never really seem to talk about. And I think in this particular case, it's the boys' childhood. And I guess Pink Floyd does deal with a crap load of trauma. So, I mean, really, any of those albums would make do for these boys. And I have to say that this episode, for me, is on par with Faith in terms of how much I love it. Really? Honestly, every single minute on screen, there's something that like, I'm like, oh my God, what about this? What about this? And I feel like, like in the notes that we have for today, like we're barely scratching the surface. (laughs) I'm just like, oh my God, I wish we could do like a four hour special on this one. We also got to watch this with our patrons. Which I think was, again, a brilliant idea because, again, as much as it's kind of created this, like, aura of, like, this is going to be an important episode or something really crazy. Again, at this point, I pretty confidently have said whenever there's a, we're we're excited to watch this one live with Drew, it's because it's going to really do something insane or wonderful. This episode stood up that test and did a lot of ridiculous things, and I was very, very pleased. There's just so much. Okay, okay. How about you do a recap for us? Count me down. Three, two, one, go. Boys wake up in bed to guns in their faces, and despite what you'd expect, they actually get killed. They wind up literally in heaven, where it's just a bunch of, like, flashbacks and memories, and they are told they need to follow the road by Cass to go meet the gardener, and along the way, they run into a bunch of their memories and have to relive little moments and kind of see each other's perspective on things, which kind of puts a rift between the two of them. But then we get to meet Ash in a luchador outfit for no reason, and Pam is back and she can see again, and the two of them and how they've been dealing with being in heaven and kind of the ups and downs of it all. All of this while running from Zachariah, and finally, they get to the gardener and they're told that God ain't gonna help you, but I'll send you back one last time, and then otherwise you're totally for real dead the next time for real dead for real time. That is a promise that we hear a lot on the show. Next time, you're really dead, though, okay? Are we ready to move into the long game? I feel like there's going to be a lot to go over, so let's dive right in. So the episode starts kind of like what you said, with uh, Roy and Walt basically killing Sam and Dean in cold blood. And I have to admit that for the longest time, I thought that these were the same hunter dudes that we met in 503 Free to Be You and Me. I thought it was, too. (laughs) They're not. (laughs) Those dudes were Tim and Reggie. But fear not, Drew, we will see Roy and Walt again in season 12. Wow, okay, didn't expect that. (laughs) Revenge is not a swift one (laughs) for the boys. Uh, We'll talk about the specifics of like what each brother saw while in heaven in story time. But like for now, I I just want to highlight the fact that for both of, of them... Their best memories are when John is not around. If I can say that again using different words, uh, I will say that Andrew Dabb co-wrote an episode where John Winchester is nowhere to be found in either of the brothers' heaven. I'm intrigued to follow this chain. (laughs) Yeah, and this also follows an episode where, you know, it was alluded that John was in fact in Dean's own personal hell, quote unquote, in 511, Sam Interrupted. Also co-written by Andrew Depp. I'm seeing a trend here. Well, I mean, I'm just, I am stating facts. That is all. (laughs) Walt's We Ain't the Only Hunters After You is really interesting to me because, like, it brings back the whole if I didn't know you, I would want to hunt you thing. And it also opens the door to the idea that the brothers are, like, being trailed or followed somehow and they didn't know it, which I think would have been a really interesting subplot for this season. Yeah, the idea of these two, like, breaking in and catching them off guard, even if all be while asleep, seems so unlikely given the way they've kind of, like, lived their lives up until now and continue to, it turns out. 
But it does make sense there would be a series of hunters who now just sort of see them collectively as something worth hunting. Exactly. And I'm just kind of like, why didn't we get to see this? I feel like it would have made this moment even more, or I don't know, I don't know, because I really like the element of surprise, I have to say. But there's also like, imagine if it had built up to this and then... Like I could see the mini-sode where it follows the two of them hunting something, but we never reveal who the hunters are or what the hunt it is. And that's always because they're using like, you know, odd camera angles or seen from behind or they're wearing hoods. And then the, you, you assume it's Sam and Dean and suddenly it's not Sam and Dean. Who are they hunting? Sam and Dean. Like it could have been a really cool establishing. Yeah. I mean, maybe they were telling themselves like, and I'm, when I say they, I'm like the, the creators of the show. were like, oh, but we've already done this with Gordon. So, so maybe that's why. But like, I don't know. I just think that that would have been like a really cool moment. Dean uses the catchphrase, let's get this show on the road. He stole our line in a live watch. <laughs> I loved it. Dean also has really internalized the idea that like Michael and Lucifer will inevitably bring him and Sam back for their own purposes. And like we've talked about this earlier in the season, but now now in this case, it works to Dean's advantage, right? Like when I come back, <laughs> like imagine you're about to kill someone. I mean, not that I imagine that for myself any regularly in any way, shape or form, but like imagine, you know. Like, oh, when I come back, like, okay, dude, <laughs> like, what are you saying? <laughs> Which is why, like, when you said, like, oh, we're going to see these two bumble, these two hunters again, I was like, oh, my God, this is going to be the greatest, like, f like, oh, my God, they're alive moment. But, like, after that many seasons, like, I'm sure they've gotten a win that they're back. This is also the second time that we hear knocking on Heaven's door so far on Supernatural. <laughs> Remind me where the first time we hear it is. It was in 213 Houses of the Holy when uh, Dean tells Sam that maybe what he saw, and I'm choosing my words, when he saw a man getting impaled in a freak accident, maybe that was God's will. Oh, right. Yes. One of the very first things that happens in heaven is that Cass finds Dean. You know, he finds a way to find him. And we don't see Cass. Like, Misha Collins is not, like, physically on set uh, he speaks through the Impala radio, but he does find him. Finds Dean right away using Dean's most favorite thing and then uses said thing to communicate with his favorite thing. Sam doesn't believe he belongs in heaven. And I think that this is really important in understanding Sam this season. It also makes me wonder if he thinks that there's any way for him to atone for what he's done. We find out that John and Mary's relationship was not perfect. Uh, in fact, it was actually on the rocks at one point. And to quote Dean, the relationship was only perfect after she died. Oh, God, that was a hard line to hear. Because when you idealize somebody like that, you forget about their flaws. And like we had never really talked about or we had never been allowed to really discuss and learn about Mary's flaws. And we're sort of like in that moment now where we can we now have an image of Mary more than we did the first few times she was brought up. We've now twice gone back in time to meet her and see her and kind of deal with her as a character and not just a concept anymore. Dean's Axis Mundi is a road. So a quick reminder, the Axis Mundi is a road that goes, or like a trail of some sort that goes through heaven. And for Dean, it's a road. And I think that this is really important, but I don't want to elaborate too much on that before the Winchesters is over, because I have a theory about it, and I just, I don't want to, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm so incredibly intrigued, because to my knowledge, you haven't been watching the Winchesters, but I'm sure you've absorbed Cultural pieces. osmosis at this point. Precisely. Like, I've gotten really little from it so far. I don't think I have anything contextually other than, like, John is aware of demons this time when he shouldn't be. Well, there you go. That's kind of why I'm thinking, like, I have a... I have, I have a theory. <laughs> Ash tells them that this isn't the first time that they've been to heaven, which we know. Yeah, but I'm also just intrigued to know how that works. Because like, we know they've obviously like had you know close encounters and they've been considered dead for a while before. But does that mean that like Ash saw Dean in heaven multiple times every single Tuesday in a mystery spot? Like, the day resets, but is he still seeing Dean in heaven and being like, here's a beer. We got, like, 30 seconds before the day resets. Cheers. How you doing? Have a great day, Casey, in 20 minutes. I would caution you against, like, pulling too hard on those threads. <laughs> I just I just want to see, like, the, the, the fanfic of, like, 
ash for a whole day just seeing Dean pop up every few minutes and being like, what is going on? Imagine how confused Dean is because his brother is basically like speaking in tongues and then he sees Ash who's like, again? <laughs> Literally just seeing it from the other point of view in heaven where it's just him waking up in heaven to a different song and Ash being like, welcome back again. Here's another one and just a pile of beers getting bigger each time. So when we recorded 112 Faith, there was a bunch of notes that like I had taken that never actually made the cut for the podcast uh, because the episode was already too long. And one of those things was how the person who put Sam on the trail of the faith healer in the first place was an old friend of John's called Joshua. And at the time, I thought it was so interesting that they decided to name him because they could have just said like an old hunter buddy of dad's, but they specifically named him Joshua. You know, in the spirit of reusing content or never losing content, I'm going to read directly from my notes in faith. So John's contact Joshua, colon, he is named, so his name is important. Given the theme of the episode, something to do with religion, there are a few Joshuas in the Abrahamic religions, but one could be the inspiration for this name. Joshua the high priest, the first high priest to oversee the reconstruction of the temple, hints that Dean's body is sacred. Further, it was Zechariah, the prophet, who had the vision of Joshua's destiny. For those who know where the show is headed, you know that this is an amazingly clever nugget of foreshadowing. Ugh. So again, like I'm going to come back and say, I don't think that this was actual like uh, conscious or uh, intentional foreshadowing, but it's just really funny how things work out. Sometimes it's really hard to say coincidence is a coincidence when it's like this apparent. Like even the fact they named this anonymous source, like. It never, they never do that. So it feels like they were planning something, whether this is what they were planning or not. I mean, again, at the time, we are assured that Eric Kripke did not want to see any angels, right? So I don't think that this is what it is. But again, like looking at it as a whole piece of art, I guess, I just think it's cool that it's in there. And like, I think in the context of this episode too, I feel like it's not unreasonable for me to think that the angel Joshua who talks to God was the one to point Sam in the direction of the faith healer who was the only person who could put Dean back together. If God is still there secretly pulling strings, it's the kind of thing he would do. Like Joshua, just call the boy, say you're a friend of John's and you know where he can get healed. Just like I've run out of ideas, just call him. <laughs> I also just imagine God sitting there, like, frustrated and being like, okay, how do I trick them into believing this now? Um, I don't know. Uh, just, I give up. Call them. I'm tired. I'm lazy. So in 503, free to be to you and me, Raphael told uh, Dean and Cass that God is dead, right? We remember that. It was very dramatic. And here we learned that God isn't dead. He knows about the apocalypse and just doesn't want to get involved. Uh, leading to one of the best lines of the episode from Dean, which is, forget it, just another deadbeat dad with a bunch of excuses, right? I'm used to that. I'll muddle through. Something, like, I know we've had a lot of moments of Dean, like, realizing how bad John is, but having him, like, just blatantly say it out loud, reassuring isn't the word, but it, like, feels good to know that he's finally figured it out. Yeah, and I think that he's still very much on the way to that. Like, and I have some thoughts about that in story time. Like, I think that this is just the beginning for him in terms of learning, like, how just how bad John really was. Like, I think he's seeing the big stuff, but he's not seeing the implications of those big things, like the effects that it really had on him and on Sam. And I think that this episode, in a way, is about, like, looking at that, like, exploding those things and putting them out in the open. Cass is absolutely devastated to hear that God won't intervene. He has spent so much time, like his entire arc this season, whenever he wasn't directly with the boys, was let me go find God because he's the only one who can fix this. And then being told like, hey, you know your only mission, the one final hope you had, you're like the last card in your deck. Yeah, discard it. So he gives the Samulet back to Dean, and then Dean ends up leaving it at the motel in a trash can. A heartbreaking moment because, it's, and we literally just like quick peek behind the curtain. We just rewatched the Christmas episode where we learned the origin of the amulet. So it's kind of like a really like weird tie-in moment here. 
there is no part of me that assumes Sam didn't scoop it out of the trash before leaving. I don't think he just left it there. Like, one, sentimental. Two, it can literally find God. Like, that's a kind of magical artifact you might want to hold on to, even if you're going to be a dramatic about it. The symbolism of it, the actual, like, the act of doing it is such a... It's it's literally the physical act of saying, I no longer believe in God. I, I will go a step further in terms of, like, what it means for the brothers. I think it means, like, leaving... Because Sam intended for this gift to go to John. And he gave it to Dean because Dean was his father figure in that moment. And if we're being honest, not just in that moment, but like throughout probably most of his childhood and teenage years, right? And I think that the leaving behind of the Samulet is in part Dean saying like, this was never up to me to do. It was never my place to parent you and Sam to accept like, it was never your place to parent me either. My most optimistic interpretation of that moment is that they're leaving behind part of their toxic, well, they're just their toxic relationship to each other because that's what it has become, right? Yeah, no, I like my uh, lack of faith in God more. <laughs> It's, it's, easy, it's an easier pill to swallow, unfortunately. <laughs> Shall we move into story time? So today, our theme is memory, and the word comes, surprise, surprise, from the Latin word memoria, which means, you know, memory, remembrance, faculty of remembering. So, I mean, I think we're, you know, this is a, a fairly easy one. I think most people listening right now know what this episode is about, and I think that for me... The theme of this episode, anyway, goes really hand in hand with another theme that we've covered this season already, which is perception. And we use that theme in 502 Good God, Y'all, which was the Horseman War episode. And I say this because I've seen people get mad at Sam or get mad at Dean for the things that they do or say to each other in this episode. And I sort of want us to keep in mind, like as we go through it, that the memories that they have are all really traumatic in their own way and that this is not the Winchester Olympics of suffering, you know, both of them coped differently with incredibly difficult situations that they've been dealt as kids and as teens. And this episode kind of offers insight into this difference, but the circumstances are the same. And this is a John Winchester hate episode. And I think that's what bothers me the most. And I, I've tried to kind of leave it aside as I discuss the brothers more individually and I think I said it during the live watch of just like, oh my God, you two idiots talk to each other because so much of this conflict feels like if they just had a conversation, they could resolve so many things, which again, sounds like the tagline for this entire series. That's never been modeled for them. It's not a part of like their how to of relationships. Yeah, I think I've said it before where it's one of those moments where we as an audience see it. And because we have the outside perspective, we're much quicker to jump to that conclusion. But we've probably all been in that scenario too, where we were like upset by something. And instead of having the rational, okay, I'm going to stop reacting and wait for you to explain things to me. And then I'll reassess the situation. You just go off base instincts because we're emotional creatures. And Exactly. And they've never talked about this before. It's the first time, or at least we don't, that we know of, that we've seen. So, like, it's very, whew, very present. Do you want to get us started with Sam? All the memories are so unique to themselves, and the memories one can, between each one, differ greatly. Uh, Sam's memories are all things that hurt Dean, as they highlighted moments in their lives where Sam was trying to get away from hunting and from being himself. But to Dean, he just sees it as someone trying to get away from him. And it really shows how they may be getting so much closer, but still have so much trouble connecting. And, and again, if, like I said, it feels like a simple conversation could resolve this. And you can kind of see Sam try to explain himself. And like, I genuinely agree with Sam here. The issue isn't the memory, nor the choice Sam made back then, but Dean's inability to hear Sam and understand him. Because again, this is internalized Dean troubles. Dean is very instinctual, very... He, he doesn't take the time to, like, look into things. He takes things on a very surface level. So to him, he is seeing a painful memory. He is seeing Sam enjoy things that hurt him without 
better understanding Sam's point of view of it. I think we as an audience very clearly see what Sam is getting out of these things. At least I feel I did. And I feel like Dean isn't seeing our Sam's view of it that we're getting. So I don't, I don't want to start off story time by being a Dean apologist, uh, which I know I tend to be. And I also find that sometimes, you know, we as like, some people at least can be talking about Sam, but like really we're talking about Sam only in relation to Dean. And I think that that's in part because of the writing of the show. Uh, That's a can of worms for another day. So if I, if I can, I, I really want to take a moment to focus on Sam and then I'll respond to what you said about Dean. In this episode, we learn that Sam's best memories, like you said, are the ones where he's away from the toxicity of his family, which for him is John and Dean. And I know that like for Dean and for a lot of people who love Dean, like myself, this is a really hard thing to learn. But let me put it this way. The fact that Dean did the best that he could for Sam doesn't take away the fact that Sam was neglected and abused by John. And the fact that Sam couldn't wait to get away from that family dynamic also doesn't take away from the things that Dean did and had to do to try to shield him from some of it. Like those two realities can and do coexist. And I think that that's what this episode is really about. Like it's about the clash of those two perspectives on common memories you would think that people who have lived the same moment would have like a similar recollection of it, but not always. And especially not for siblings. I think with both of them, I kind of do a little bit of back and forth because they are so intertwined with the way the memories are perceived. But for Sam, it really, it, it, it feels like we're seeing like visions of Sam season one, where really he was just in the hunt to like finish it. So we can go back to school and regular life and non hunting life. And we are seeing that wasn't a recent thing. That wasn't a recent development in Sam. He's always wanted this. You know, his earliest memory is going on a very regular date with a very regular girl at a very regular family dinner because he just wanted a regular life. He just wanted to belong, really. Can we really blame teen and preteen Sam for wanting to get away from a family situation where he's like, unhoused, living out of motels and his dad's car, left alone to starve for weeks at a time, changing schools every few months, and if he's lucky, because apparently sometimes it was every few weeks, and like with a with a dad who spent his Thanksgivings, quote, passed out on the couch. No matter how good Dean was at being like a brother parent, like it 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 nothing can make that better. Weird example to pull here, but I'm thinking back to the movie Matilda, of all things. Again, just because she had one good teacher who cared for her doesn't magically make the rest of her shitty life better. Like, yes, she had literally there. The entire point of that film is escaping the shittiness to go to that goodness. That's literally what Sam does here. Sam pulls a Matilda. And they also had weird psychic powers, too. Huh. Interesting. Like, while we're here, though... Because I'm going to I'm going to go there. Being accepted into college is usually a happy memory. Being accepted into Stanford is usually a very happy memory. And like, sure, it's bittersweet for those of you who are like are not going to go with you. But like, it's not usually like a terrible, traumatic, worst memory ever. Like what made that memory so terrible for Dean I don't think is the fact that Sam left. It was that John made it into the drama that he did, he told Sam, like, if you go, don't come back. And like, apparently they had this huge fight about it. And he's the one who raised those stakes, right? That was John. That wasn't Sam. Like, it didn't have to be this way, but John made it so. He's the reason why this memory is as traumatic as it is for Dean. Not Sam. Again, to go back to the Dean for a moment here, it's the fact that he doesn't put that together the way we are. And again, emotionally charged, traumatic moment, understandably a little bit fuzzy brained. You're right. It's 100% not the Sam has left part, which I mean, hurts. It's the John made this a big thing that physically tore our family apart. Right. And that's the thing. Like Dean was what about like 22 ish at the time when this would have happened. So he wasn't a kid anymore. But I, you know, the thing is that like, when you've heard your entire life, somebody say like, look at what 
Sam is doing to this family. Look at what Sam is doing. It's his fault. Like, I don't know. I don't think that you can think properly when that happens. And it takes a really long time and to, to kind of like get away from that kind of thinking. And we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more, but like, it's, he's only now starting to realize some of the things that his dad did to them as being terrible. He hasn't start like completely like untangling all of that other stuff. Well, since we're already talking about Dean, do you want to give us some, uh, some other thoughts about Dean? <laughs> I feel like we do that very often. We always get back to Dean anyways. And again, for me, that's part of it is like the writing of the show. But anyway, I'm not starting that now. <laughs> so what kind of feels like a bit of like, uh, you know, pot calling kettle black here, whereas all of Sam's memories are like these moments of escaping, you know, his life, which Dean sees as this terrible thing. With Dean's memories, while the first one, kind of that first initial, like let's introduce him to heaven is a him and Sam, which I think is really wholesome and reminds us that no matter what, he loves his brother and he loves being a little kid with his brother as opposed to a hunter with his brother. His big memory is a pre-Sam memory with Mary and not just with Mary, but without John. And I think we've kind of hit that one on the nail, that nail in the head several times already now. It just, it shows what Dean longs for. And I think we've alluded to this even as far back as in Bugs, when he gets to enjoy a nice shower for the first time in a forever you know, he longs for a simple time when he was safe and innocent and was truly able to be himself. I I feel like moments like that with Mary may have been some of the last times he got to be himself. Possibly. You know, Dean's memories mirror Sam so much. The reality is that they both fondly recall the same feeling, which is both of them being happy in the simplicity of being who they want to be and around people that consider them normal. I think at the end of the day, like kids and teens and adults, really, like we just we just want to feel safe and supported. And I think that, you know, Sam and Dean's approach to finding those things is very different. Like Sam felt like he had to go outside of the home and Dean desperately craved it from within the home because he knew that that was possible. Whereas Sam, Sam didn't. Yeah, well, as we see here. Yeah, the first thing that Sam goes to is is a family dinner. Of a family that he's not a part of. Oh, Sam. Dean Dean has vague, small, and minor memories of being a wholesome family. You know, and even if the happiest memories are sans John, he still has the recollection of just him, his brand new baby brother, and his amazing, at least to a child of parents. We assume there was a point before John kind of whatever happened in that memory with uh, between John and Mary's on the rocks relationship. You know, he remembers being a happy child in a happy enough home that he can go back to it. Like as much as I will always defend, you know, like Sam's right to his own feelings, because sometimes I feel like, you know, he shouldn't feel this way. Well, (laughs) he does, though. There you go. (laughs) Like I really empathize with Dean's heartbreak, like of finding out that Sam's best memories are some of his worst. So like, I yeah, just want to be clear about that. Yeah, which just feels very twisted. Like the fact that like, I'm sure if you really tried, you could pull like hundreds of memories out of Sam that would be considered happy memories. And while some of them would likely involve being away from Dean and John, I'm sure there's some that mean he was away and it wasn't actively like a traumatic moment for Dean. <laughs> like it feels really unlike unlucky that like the one they chose was something that was so traumatic for Dean. Like I feel like Zachariah may have been trying something here. Perhaps. Recently, and you mentioned this earlier, but like we hosted a live watch of A Very Supernatural Christmas. And like after the episodes, one of our patrons, Nell, who wrote a paper about parentification, actually talked about that for a little bit with us. And one of the things that she said was that parentified children can have their entire identities like enmeshed with other members of their family. Obviously, I'm thinking about Dean here, and I think that that's what's happening here. He's taking like Sam's fondness of his memories alone as a personal rejection. Like, am I not good enough for you? Can't I be your everything all the time, all at once? And like, no, Dean, that is not healthy. You know, you can't be everything to Sam. You can't be his brother, his parent, his his mother, his father, his best friend. Like that is, that doesn't, it doesn't work like that the choice of these memories to be the ones that come up, are there ones that help like very clearly delineate those moments? 
between them where Sam sees freedom in getting away and Dean just sees it as like a personal attack because of the way he was forced to bring Sam up. Like they feel very well planted by a certain mastermind who needs to be punched in the dick. I mean, I will say this, that he didn't, you know, I don't know that he can like control heaven. Well, I mean, we see him basically do it at the end there when he brings in evil Mary and like sets them in their house. Once he finds them. Okay, I'm still saying some influence here and there. I don't know. I'm sure that is possible. On the other hand, and I do want to be very clear about this, like I also completely understand the horror of like having your little brother run away when you're supposed to be watching him. Quote, and when dad came home, dot, 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 end quote. Like, I honestly don't want to think about what John did to Dean when he came home. Because, like, again, Sam Sam wasn't running away from Dean specifically. He was running away from John. And I doubt that Sam would have run away from Dean on Dean's watch if he'd had a well-adjusted loving father. Everything keeps coming back to John. And I know that Dean takes it, like, personally because he feels responsible for Sam. But he should have never been responsible for Sam. Sam was not his responsibility. He was John's. I'm sorry, I'm very angry. We're going in circles, but in a good way. So we're circling the same point repeatedly. And I think we're making it very clear is that these memories really clearly highlight for the two of them what they want and what they both fear from the other one. I think Dean more so than Sam in that second part of we really, you know, when it comes to Dean's memories, Sam is kind of just like, I'm so removed from these. But when it comes to Sam's memories, they are like almost direct. Dean feels they are direct attacks on him and who he is as a person. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's also the difference between Sam and Dean. Sam doesn't take it as a personal attack of being like, oh, that's your best memory, but I'm not even in it. And like, I say this as like a Dean stan, right? So I I just. Like, I understand Dean's reaction, especially in the two, the major scenario of the Sam running away one. It's again, it's, it's to go back to my earlier statement. A conversation could solve this, but that isn't a thing that either of them can do. And that's kind of the thing that I want to get to, like, because at the end of the day, like, I, I, the, one of the reasons why I relate to Dean so much is because, like, I see him as having PTSD, which I also have. And, like, one of the things that's really hard is that in the moment when you're brought back to that exact situation where you felt so shitty and, like, you felt under attack, you're going to react the same way that you did when you were under attack, even though you are not in that situation anymore. And I feel like Dean is incapable at that moment to make the difference between an actual attack and a perceived attack. And that's something that I think folks who deal with that sort of of disorder uh, have to put so much work into learning to unlearn. Um, And Dean hasn't done that work because he hasn't had the time to decompress ever in his life. The dude won't have a conversation. I don't think a full-on breakdown of his psyche to learn how to correct his actions and, like, handle situations better is anywhere on his horizon, unfortunately. I feel for Dean, but the way that he is reacting in this moment is, to me, like, indicative of the fact that, like, he is very much very wounded and hasn't done any work on himself yet to be able to heal from this. And he will. We'll see that in in future seasons. Like we'll see. Yeah, we see him change a little bit and we see Sam change also in and and realize a little bit more like the perspective of the other one. But in that moment, they're just not ready for that. I also just want to briefly highlight that like at four years old, Dean was already trying to emotionally take care of his mother. So to me, that really indicates that there were already problems in the home even before Mary died. And that's also the moment that made Sam go, like, I just never realized how long you've been cleaning up dad's messes. And for me, that is like a path, like just one step closer towards Sam, like realizing how much pressure Dean has felt to step up for his for his father's failures and to shield Sam from, from what John had done because he's trying to shield his mother from... From the harm of John. Anyway. That single scene and those very few lines do so much to craft so much emotion in this. Do we want to look at Pam and Ash real quick? We do want to talk about Pam and Ash. Sure. Yeah. Pam and Ash play two sides of a coin in this episode. 
while neither really interacts with like the theme in any way that I can really see, like their idea of memory isn't like huge. They both do a lot to try and shape the story this week. You know, Ash is happy in heaven, uh, but understands the afterlife being cool and awesome isn't a reason to like disregard earth and the living. Like he's actively working to help the brothers and like make a difference and be his own version of a weird Mexican wrestling superhero up there, which I love. I have so many headcanons about that. Pam is almost like trying to convince Dean to just give up and stay dead and stick with her in heaven. And I feel like this is like some kind of philosophical viewpoint that I need to get into more. I just can't my finger on it per se. Like there's some sort of like, if you know there's an afterlife and you've achieved like this getting to heaven, which is the ultimate goal do you just stop and end there? Or if you know you could go back and make things better, do you like, I'm not sure if there's a specific philosophical debate here or if there's like a, I mean, I don't know. I'm sure that probably in the field of theology, there are people who talk about that, but like, I don't, I'm not sure. (laughs) If you know more, please write in voicemail, call us, text us, let us know, tweet at us. I have a pager. Get me. And, and I think I, you know, I'm going to hop on your like, potential um conspiracy theory idea because like they only see ash and pam after zachariah finds them so it makes me wonder if they really are who they say they are or if they're like a zachariah tactic to get dean to agree to say yes to michael and like that doesn't work and zachariah like shows them like he ups the ante and shows them a fake mary like just after this who tells dean that she never loved him which i think i think you know whether or not we like mary we can agree we can all agree that for the most part that is not true you know like at the very most base level common denominator like that is just not true yeah i feel like a good lie always has like a little like kernel of truth at the middle so like this just a bad lie like Zachariah is like running out of moves here he's like oh uh, your mom hates you it's like way to go third grader trying to insult me like what next you're gonna say I have cooties like fuck off punch in the dick that guy punch in the dick let's move on to critical time yeah so this episode was written by Andrew Dabb and Daniel Laughlin and directed by Jeff will know what's in the hunter's journal this week let's crack it open and find out I remember how nice it was to see old friends, remembering hunts long since past, putting aside old arguments. We cheered to good fortune and good health, as a few of them chuckled. Like every time it ended as I woke, alone in the motel, I'd heard stories of heaven and seeing my old buddies and being able to keep them this time was my heaven. The nights I dreamt of them, while bittersweet, were a welcome change to the nightmares I more regularly faced. The days after usually left me feeling much better, even happy at times. I'd go about my day and actually talk to the waitress at the cafe or the bus driver on the long boring ride back to the motel. It reminded me that I can be happy again, even if it meant waiting until the end of my own story. Oh my. Just a little something on the topic of the idea of heaven and it being like a happy ending. You you gotta, you gotta, you gotta make it there at your own pace. Oh man. Okay. Any thoughts you want to share with us this week? Do you want to hear my theory about what the fight between John and Mary was about? Yes, please, more than anything, go on, please tell me. In Dean's memory, Mary says that John has two boys at home, and that means that Sam was born already. So we know that Mary died when Sam was six months old, meaning like Sam was just, just born, and that would have made Dean about four years old. Now, if we go back to the pilot, there's, in the very first few minutes, like, there's an interaction in Sam's bedroom between Mary and Azazel, who, like, we as the audience and Mary first think is John, where he tells her to go back to bed, and she kind of makes the face, like, oh, okay. And, like, we find out seconds later that John was actually watching TV, drinking beer in the living room. And so all of this together sort of makes me think that they were still dealing with this big fight when Mary died. Another piece of the puzzle is that Mary had never told John about her being a hunter. So my theory is that I think that John somehow found out about that and moved out. Now, let's listen back to what she tells him in Dean's memory. 
No, John, we're not having this conversation again. Think about what? You've got two boys at home. Fine, then don't. There's nothing more to talk about. So, like, I know that there's lots of ways to potentially ex explain this fight, but I, I really think that this holds the road in terms of how, like, it fits within, like, the canon of the show. Damn, I love this theory. It makes so much sense. And, again, even, I think, would add credence to the whole, like, John becoming a hunter after all this and, it, like, right away kind of following the demon train. And that's the thing. What I find really cool about this is that we get little nuggets in later seasons that sort of like not speak directly to this theory, but definitely like support it, add supporting beams to it, basically. I'll be very intrigued to get to their get to those when we do. For now, shall we hear what our community has to share with us? This week, we have a message from Nell. And before we listen to it, we want to remind you to send us a three-minute voicemail. To respond to anything we discuss today, you can use the recording app on your phone and just email us the recording at carryingwayward at gmail.com. We also want to remind you that Drew and I will be answering the question, do you think Sam and Dean have a shared heaven for our Roadhouse patrons and coffee supporters on our Impala Talk? Hey, Carrying Wayward, it's Nell again, here to talk about Dean and Sam's relationship to food. Um... So Sam, we know, likes to eat healthy and chooses healthy options. That sort of becomes a running joke in the show almost that like Sam will go for the salad. And Dean chooses burgers and fries and whatever he can get that's, that's unhealthy. And I think that has a lot to do with the way they grew up and their different perspectives on their childhoods. So Sam chooses healthy food because he is running away from and rejecting the way he grew up, which was going to be on unhealthy food. It was going to be on fast food. It was going to be on whatever scraps they could get. And to Dean, that reads as though Sam's saying that what he provided wasn't good enough. Because um, we all we all know that Dean is the one who really made sure that Sam was eating and, and getting what he needed growing up. And so Dean is seeing this as a rejection and as though he wasn't good enough. Um, and since Dean likes to hate himself, you know, he he sort of leans into it. But he also leans into the unhealthy food because he's trying to convince himself that it is enough and that you can live a life off of it. Um, and so we do get I think those different perspectives there, which have a lot to do with how they view their childhoods respectively. Um, and even the same events, how they view them with very different eyes. So um, we, we see that they have very different perspectives on the memories that they both have. Um, and one of the things that I think we can see is that much of what Sam does in this show is try to push away his past and escape from the life he grew up in. And to Dean, that is a rejection of Dean and his work raising Sam, which creates a lot of tension that I think neither of them is really willing to acknowledge it a lot of times. I also want to sort of say that... Dean is someone, and we, we find this out in Dark Side of the Moon, that, you know, Dean is someone who is willing to find joy within his circumstances. He knows they're living inside this sort of, like, tight box of a worldview. They've got these boundaries. And he chooses to find joy within them, whereas Sam seeks to escape those confines to find joy. And so, in that way, they've got these very different, you know, both valid ways of coping with their lives, but it creates that tension between them because Sam is rejecting John and rejecting the circumstances of their, of their childhoods. And Dean sees that as Sam saying, Dean didn't do a good enough job raising him, couldn't give him what Sam wanted and needed. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, sorry for the tragic hot take. We know I like those, but um, yeah, let's, let's keep talking about it. Thanks guys. Bye. Well, thank you, Nell, for that amazing voicemail. Also, I love that we asked for three-minute voicemails. This was three minutes on the dot. <laughs> like, I don't think it was intentional, but I love that it worked out that way. I love the perspective of how each of them view or how each of them use food in the same way these memories kind of work and how they are two sides of a, of, of a coin. We kind of have, like, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and repeat everything you just said, but, like, I fully agree and I think it puts a whole new perspective on the idea of their their way of healthy eating versus unhealthy eating. 
and given everything Mary and I have chatted about this episode about the two of them and their lack of communication and their different viewpoints on a similar uh, upbringing, it adds another layer to kind of like always exist. Like it's been there this whole time, even though the health food thing kind of like was a more recent add on ish thing, but like has always been implied for Sam in my own head. I just thought it was a really great way to look at it. And especially linking it to this episode of all episodes helps really just define that, you know, Dean sees it as Sam rejecting him yet again. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nell. I mean, I feel like, uh, this, this entire episode is sort of like, like you've contributed very strongly to this episode with the voicemail and with, you know, the discussion that we had earlier (laughs) on parentification. So thank you very, very much for that. I mean, so first off, I just want to I think that Sam uses food also as a way to quote unquote purify his body, keep his body quote unquote clean. And this is incredibly like problematic, I find, in the way that like we view food as like healthy or unhealthy. Um, like that dichotomy when really at the end of the day, like with the cost of food today, like fed people, like feeding people quote unquote healthy food is incredibly hard. So like so long as you're feeding your people, you're doing great. So that being said, I think that the boys use food in very different ways, but I would argue that that's basically everything. Look at the way that they treat education. Look at the way that Sam uses education to try to get himself away from his situation. Whereas Dean just like is very happy to stay where he is or like, I don't want to say that, but Definitely has less of a drive than Sam does to see it as a tool to get out of where he is. Uh, even the way that they look at relationships and the way that like they look at uh, housing situations. And we saw that in Bugs, actually. We'll just keep bringing up Bugs. I can't believe that this episode was so foundational to the series. <laughs> the worst episode ever. Um, so I, I feel like they're all, they're both of them using like, they're approaching so many things in their lives so differently because of the different ways that they lived the same situation of neglect in their, in their childhood. And so it's no surprise. I think that food would be like a very salient thing just because it also represents comfort uh, in so many ways. And it's like, like we see that Dean for Dean, there is nothing more comforting than a PB and J with the crusts cut off. And like, I cannot believe that I didn't note that in the long game because that's something that comes back, actually. I'm sort of mad that I didn't note it there. So there you go. Now it's noted. And yeah, I hope that like our entire conversation today sort of helped answer this question that you had. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I completely agree with you. This is entirely John's John's fault. Like, Dean, my beloved, you, you did nothing wrong. You did everything you could. So while we reflect on all the all the good Dean did do when he had to, let's go reflect ourselves on this week's episode. My inspiration didn't come from a character I sorely missed so much in my, my little Ash. Someone pointed it out during our live watch was like, oh, like in this recreation of the bar, like even the little like the monkey statuette is still there. And like that seems like a small thing, but it's like. That was like a part of his memory, a part of the bar to him, something that brought him joy clearly, that it was worth bringing back and remembering and keeping as part of his own personal heaven. So all that to say, I want to remember to look for the little things that make me happy in life and appreciate them while I can and not have them taken away from me or like only realize it too late. So just really just a... Remember the little things that bring me joy and keep them close and keep me happy. And there's nothing wrong with that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, very, very uh, anti um, Mary Kondo. Like, just give me more stuff. I mean, a terrible example here. <laughs> no, that's not what she says, actually, at all. She says, only keep the things that bring you joy. And I just have a lot of things that do that. But there you go. <laughs> she doesn't say, like, you have to keep few things. She says, just keep the things that bring you joy. And I am very open to joy through a lot of things. And what do you have for us this week? Honestly, this episode is making me feel called to do the work that I'm asking Dean to do and understand that people 
can have conflicting perceptions of a memory. Um, it doesn't make my truth and my reality any less real or valid, uh, but I really think that there are situations in life where it's necessary to accept that multiple truths can coexist. I, I won't ask to dig any deeper because it sounds very personal. And if you're not looking to share, that's fine. But it does sound like a very powerful and important stance to take. Thank you. You've been listening to Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast produced by Rochelle Castellano, hosted by Drew Shulman and myself, Marie Vigourou. Thank you to our bunker patrons, Katira, Michelle, and Jeremiah Thomas for their generous support. This week, we'd like to thank Nell for her message. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Hive, and YouTube using at Carrying Wayward. And leave us a rating and review on your podcast service of choice. And don't forget to join our coffee or Patreon for perks and extra content. You can use the link in all of our social media bios or go directly to carryingwayward.com. Carry on our wayward friends. If they really are who they, who they say they are, I became very French right there. <laughs> I was in a water book. What just happened there? <laughs>